Every good project has to start out with a catchy name. One of the things we tried to do was encapsulate our ideas and, and the goals of this project as a predictive modeling of flood susceptibility, um, emphasizing phase one due to the time constraints as well as the um, unplanned geographic distribution happening right now. Uh, we really wanted to emphasize that this is kind of a, a kickoff and first steps of understanding the project in order to um, facilitate handoff and enable future groups to come along and not have to relearn it all from the beginning. So um, our class is a cognitive science class. And again, this partnership is with USRA. And we're really excited to be here with you all today. We have um, a fantastically skilled interdisciplinary team, beginning with Alex. Um, he's on here somewhere. There he is. Um, Alex is an applied mathematician. Um, a, all kinds of cool natural language processing skills, and it's been neat to see some of his work this semester. And then uh, myself, I'm Madeline Brown, and I'm a geographer. My background is in uh, GIS and coupled human natural systems, and I'll be talking a little bit about that today. And then we have Ritesh, our electrical engineer and computer scientist, and Umesh Krishnamurthy, who is our cognitive scientist. Um, and we really feel like our unique combination of skills um, enabled this program to have a really solid foundation in combining our skill sets and we were excited to do so. So throughout the next about half hour, 45 minutes, we'll talk about how we conceptualized the project from the beginning and how we went on to frame it and evolve the question over time. We'll discuss understanding risk, how humans perceive risk in the built environment, how to visualize these risks and threats and then modeling the challenges and potential solutions. And then we'll wrap up with the summary and our references and appendices, and of course, um, time for questions. So to start out um, in our initial meeting with Ada and Dr. Bell, uh, the question we started out with was, how can we visualize if it's flooding or not, given three initial data sets? And as we explored this problem as a team, the, um, the question evolved into, what factors do we need to understand to incorporate as many essential data sets as necessary to forecast and visualize risk? Because we're looking at a, a global problem, so there are going to be a lot of different, different factors to include to make sure we're asking the right questions and um, then answering it properly. And so um, a quote I felt like kind of encapsulated this idea is from uh, Woodward that our phenomena are inferred from our data. And so to understand your phenomenon, you have to have a solid grasp of, of your data. So to understand our problem, we want to frame it as a coupled human and natural systems issue. We don't really have a natural disaster without a human component. So it's people and place equals a natural disaster. If a flood were to occur with nobody around, it's not really a disaster, it's just this natural phenomenon. But what makes it a disaster is this, this combination of our physical geography and geology, as well as the human component. Um, wrapped up in our era of anthropogenic climate change. And something that's happening is that areas that weren't originally prepared or are underprepared are having to cope in new ways, such as these big atmospheric rivers we get in California, where we receive um, significant portions of our precipitation in a limited amount of time. These, their frequency and uh, duration is changing, so areas aren't necessarily prepared to handle that um, where they would have been prepared for other events in the past. So climate change is, is an ongoing factor, of course. And then we need to think specifically about the physical geography. And the, the earth is so varied, it's hard to come up with a global solution with just a few um, input factors. So we want to think about things like slope, which way water is moving, uh, features on the land that might be directing water, and even things like soil porosity and water retention, um, down to the permeability of the, the soil type. And that kind of brings us to this human component um, at a transitional space of concrete. Uh, concrete is taking over areas that used to be porous, and it creates um, unnatural runoff, then impacting downstream uh, water uh, conveyances and, and banks. So we've had this outdated infrastructure, non-existent infrastructure we discussed, and something that we're seeing happen, um, particularly in the state of California, is how things are even declared a disaster. And the way they do that in California 
is they base it off of financial damage to public infrastructure, which I, uh, I find particularly interesting as a geographer because the damage to public infrastructure in a place like Mariposa County, which is very rural, doesn't add up as quickly as it does compared to an area like Orange County or Los Angeles. And Mariposa County in particular is um, such a, a poor county financially that they haven't even added any roads since 1990. And if you can imagine with, with climate change happening with the complicated geography and geology in Mariposa, where they have fires that destabilize slopes and then we get these atmospheric rivers, all of these people and place components add up to a disaster occurring. And to kind of frame this idea of these different factors um, aligning to cause a disaster that we could potentially notify people about using a novel solution, um, we have these three vignettes and it, it encapsulates the idea that um, there's not really a, a good one size fits all solution. And so um, I'll just cover quickly the Red River Basin flooding in March of 2009. This was a riverine flood um, of the Red River and it starts out in central Canada and it winds south through North Dakota and South Dakota. And this wasn't necessarily from a precipitation event. This was from rapid snowmelt and then frozen ground where the ground was unable to absorb the influx of moisture. And this flood had a, a linear footprint because it was following the banks of the river that were then overflown. And the landscape's continental. This is middle America, generally flat, maybe a little hilly, but it's not like any kind of flood we would have um, in, the, in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Um, the most impacted city of this flood was in Grand Forks, North Dakota, which for North Dakota is a big city, but um, compared to other areas, it's pretty small with a population of 50,000. But because of what is in the area and the linear extent of this flooding, it cost over three and a half billion dollars in damage. So then the next vignette that we have is in September. So you can already see um, seasonal variation to these, these flooding events that are occurring. And this was the Colorado Front Range flood. And these might be more um, forward in people's minds because it was more recent. And this was from um, a major precipitation event where a storm was coming over the Rockies and got stalled and dumped 17 inches of rain in about two days worth of time. And something unique that happened here was because of the landscape where two different canyons came together to create one major flow. Um, and it wiped out essentially the city of Lyons, Colorado, which is a tiny city by any metric of about 2000 people. But because of the um, environment and the, the desire for people to live their nice homes and the infrastructure that was damaged, it cost $4 billion. And then this third little vignette, um, we've got a summer event in Arizona where they have their regular seasonal monsoon floods happening. But in this case, the city pumps were overwhelmed. And this is an example of human infrastructure that at one point was new and fancy, not being able to keep up. And this had um, a circular footprint um, in comparison to the, the line essentially of the Red River flood and the Y shape of the canyons of the Colorado floods. And the most impacted city in this scenario was Mesa with about half a million people. But even though the population is huge compared to the first two instances, it costs relatively less at only $18 million. So um, each of these listed items underneath the photos are considered confounding factors when you think about a flooding event or you think about a natural disaster. And they can help us make determinations about what kind of data we would need to include in an effective model. And then one um, big underlying consideration is this concept of scale. And uh, challenges are driven by mismatches in scale. And a vignette of this occurring was in that same Lyons flood in um, 2013 in the Colorado uh, Rockies. Um, in the city of Boulder, they not only had this flash flooding and inundation, as you can see in this image, um, they already had infrastructure built to, to deal with flooding and they have bike paths that are specifically designed to flood to deviate water from higher risk areas. But what you're seeing here is a mismatch in scale. Um, and if you can see my mouse, um, we kind of start on the bottom left corner where your spatial scale, the amount of area that an event is occurring over, it's really small. You have things like little pop-up thunderstorms, um, creeks don't take up a lot of space. Um, and thunderstorms move quickly and creeks when water is flowing, they generally flow quickly. But as you move from your origin, 
your scales increase and then your temporal scales increase and then you have longer term processes like drought and glaciation um, snow melt is it depends on what's happening but snow melt can be fast or slow and that's also where you make the transition from something being a weather event to something being a climate event so what we were seeing in boulder here is that their spatial and temporal scales didn't align um, with their their community area, it received more water in an amount of time than it could handle. So that brings us into thinking about the built environment and who is within the built environment um, to be considered. And so for that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Umesh and he will take over the presentation portion and I'll remain flipping uh, the slides. Okay, yeah, so um, so like, like Maddie said, so so Maddie sort of uh, went over um, you know different ways of characterizing floods, and uh, and I'm going to talk about different ways of characterizing people. So 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 starting with you know how how we can define how we can establish different demographics. There are there are a lot of different ways to do that within the context of um, of issues like this, of issues like flooding. So we can look at you know standard census data like gender, age, ethnicity, and so forth. We can look at we can look at health problems. So you know both physiological problems as well as mental health. Um, and then and then getting more specific to the to the to the context of flood flood data in particular, um, we can also think about location. So so location in terms you know where, where where do these people live it, in terms of like you know urban versus rural. Um, communities, as well as you know, how how close to a shoreline are they? Short are they are they very close to a shoreline, or are they do they live further inland? Um, as well as elevation, um, and then uh, also in terms of where they live, what about different types of countries? So we can think about you know um, um, economic status of of the countries that they live in, uh, whether you're talking about developed countries, emerging countries, underdeveloped countries. Then another aspect of where of where you live is land tenure. So, so do you so do you own the property that you live on? Do you rent it? Are you squatting on it? So, so these are really the the, the different types of, of ways that we might uh, that, that we might um, put people in categories when we're trying to figure out you know who's uh, who is more at risk or less at risk of being involved in a major flooding event. So that really, really brings us to this question: What is the best way to to categorize people for these kinds of data? And then, so the other, the other sort of human aspect that I wanted to, that I looked at for the purposes of this uh, of this project was um, was perceived risk. So, in other words, the difference between perceived risk and actual risk. So, to that end, I conducted a literature review where I looked at um, a, a few different papers that. That conducted, you know, surveys of, of residents in various communities, in order to, in order to see, um, like how how well people understand their um, their their risk. So uh, before I get into the specific those specific findings, I want to just just um, just talk about um, risk perception at a, at a more general level. So it's already fairly common knowledge that that human beings are not very good at evaluating risk um you know and, and there, there are a number of different reasons for that you know we are you know we are in general very very emotional um creatures where we're, we're motivated more by um by emotion rather than you know rational thinking and so as a result we tend to judge the probability of a given event based based on past experience based on what's what has happened to us before and that that's certainly one one element of a um, of a proper risk evaluation, but that's the thing. It's it's only one element. The, the the past is only one part of calculating the probability of a future event. And so you know there are, there are particularly with something like a flood, there are all these other considerations that we need to that we need to factor in. The, um, the, that the problem is that people don't understand those considerations very well. So, so, the, so that, that begs this question, how do we effectively communicate the, those other factors? How do we effectively evaluate the probability of a serious weather event like a flood? And just as importantly, effectively communicate that probability to a, to a population that, that has a, a very limited understanding of how probability works. Uh, Maddie, can you, thanks, okay. 
So, so now I want to want to talk specifically about the lit, about uh, this literature. Um, so, first of all, there are sort of three different. Uh, so, there are a few different ways of characterizing risk. So, so, so there's there's this way of, of these these three categories. So, so how so, so how much are you aware that you live in an at risk area? How aware are you of you know the, the warning systems um, that that your community uses? To notify you of of, uh, of major weather events, as well as awareness of what you need to do in response to those to those warning systems, and another another option is the is um uh, so to the right there's this matrix that compares you know that sort of does a factorial comparison of you know the probability of a serious flooding event with the um with the the severity of the consequences of such an event. And so, so this this sort of ties in with with what Maddie was going over a moment ago, where um, she you know she said that you know for the most part you know this, the severity of a flood is is measured by the amount of property damage and and casualties uh, that, that that it causes. So that that's one that's that's another way of doing it. So comparing prob the probability of such an event with its with with this with its severity if it were to occur. And uh, unfortunately, you know, look, going back to these three categories, most people are unaware of risk in all of them. Um, they, so they, they tend to complain that, this, that the information is very unclear and very difficult to understand, even, even when it is readily available. So, so first of all, it's not always available to begin with. And even when it is available, it's usually very difficult to understand. And another, another important thing to note here is that is that this this lack of awareness, this this general lack of of uh, this this poor risk perception, is not because of apathy. It's not that people are apathetic to to, to flooding activity. As much as it is, um, people just, just don't have access. Generally, don't have access to understandable information. In fact, you know, in 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 this particular survey, um, they they, they polled residents who, who actually, you know, when they first moved into the into the uh, their communities. They actually went out of their way to, 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 re to learn about, you know, uh, the flood risk in, in the area. And no matter how hard they tried, they, they just couldn't find any, any, um, any uh, valuable information about that. So a, a few other points related to risk perception. So um, again, we, we sort of, we sort of touched on this point um, earlier, but Statistical risk does not significantly factor into perceived risk. So, um, so, so again, it's it's um, perceived risk is based much more on on past experience, and whereas you know informational factors such such as the news, um, they they can have an effect, but in gen but typically they only have an effect in the absence of that direct past experience. And then, so so cultural factors. Um, uh, are, are are not are not primary causes of risk perception, but they can they they can mediate risk perception. Okay, so so, so sort of sort of boiling the, all of this down into into a series of of, of um, crucial guiding questions. Um, so so first of all, people judge uh, again. People judge risk primarily based on past experience and and all all other. Um, uh, factors like um, news sources, so informational factors, um, are all, are almost always secondary to prior experience. And so, so with that in mind, what we really need then is a more standardized way, of both in terms of characterizing demographics as well as in characterizing um, risk, both perceived risk as well as actual risk. Um, the, the problem is that people tend to interpret the same information differently. So, so, so again, this, this ties into to, with a, with a point that Maddie raised about how, um, you know, th there is no there is no one size fits all solution, but we can we can uh, strive for a one size fits most solution. So we can we can find you know we can figure out um, a, a, a visualization method that that works for the majority of the population. And and then think and then um, look into special considerations for for um, for those statistical outliers. So that so that really boils down. So this all really boils on into these two guiding questions. So so first of all, what's the best way to characterize user demographics? 
So, uh, so, so, when, so the, that slide earlier, we we're, were looking at you know things like age, gender, um, uh, you know, various aspects of, of where a person lives, as well as what's the best way to present risk analysis. So, so, so what is the most um, understandable way to, um, to to let people know like how likely they are to be involved in a serious flooding event? So that so that that basically covers um, the. Uh, uh, so I guess Maddie and I have, have both bas basically covered the um, conceptual backstory, sort of the um, the the motivations and the and the real questions, the guiding questions that we're keeping in mind um, uh, as as we were doing the, this project. So now um, I'm going to uh, give the floor over to Ritesh, and he's going to um, go go more into the um, um, the the process of visualization. Hi, uh, so uh, thank you, Maggie and Umesh. So as Maggie and Umesh discussed that um, the main factor which, are, which needs to be incorporated in predicting flood, it is also important how we visualize flood and how the data is stored before we visualize. And there are two important um, methods or the formats which people use, uh, raster format and vector format. Raster format is a format where each uh, you divide the entire space into grid, and each grid represents some amount of area on the earth, representing some values. This uh, raster format can be a different uh, format like .nc, .tf, but these are completely less expensive and require more memory. So that's a downside of uh, raster format. There is another format called vector format, which are good to represent shapes. So if you have to represent shapes of uh, an area, polygon is bursting, or if you want to uh, represent a river, line is best. So, there's another formula called vector format, which is like uh, got SHP and got JSN are uh, some of the formats which people can use for the visualization. And these are completely expensive because each time when you read this file, you have to come, uh, evaluate the shapes before you visualize. But it takes less memory because they are based on the points. So, yeah. So, um, I uh, went through uh, some of the visualization which people have done in the past. So, one of the visualization was done by um, Guo and uh, authors at Kuhon 9. It was based on ArcGIS. So, they, what they did is like uh, if you see uh, closely to the visualization on top, uh, top left, you will see like uh, there are buildings and there is a blue color that's water and then there is green color which is a green. That's how people have used for visualization before. Then uh, in, uh, if you see top right, there is a visualization which was completely render rendering open GL. So what they did is like they developed the terrain using some methods and then they apply capture map on the top to visualize slug. If you see top uh, bottom left, there is a visualization where it is, uh, what they did is like, they took a, a simulation of a flood using some SPH method, and the outcome of those method is visualized on the top of a 3D spatial temporal GS application. So they have not mentioned the name, so I don't know what, the, what application they have used. And the fourth one is World Wing, where uh, what they did is like, they computed pixels at the region where the, uh, based on elevation, and based on elevation, what they did is like they compute all the neighboring uh, pixels, and until the pixel is at special value, uh, there is a flag. If they, that is above, then there is no flag. So these formats are mostly of got TIF format. So next one is um, okay. So based on my uh, literature review, what I found like. The best way to visualize a uh, flood is using either Nahaj Web Wall Wing or ArcGIS. The reason behind that is because they are easily integrable. You can easily integrate into uh, using any JavaScript code. Second thing, it can be deployed on web, so it's accessible to many people. Third is technical support and documentation, which is available uh, on the web. So this makes a better choice for us to use either Web Wall Wing or ArcGIS. So I, I did uh, one experiment with uh, seeing how these 
uh, web evolving works. So I took a data from uh, USGS for river and river basin, and visualized .hp file. If you see on the top, on the right side, there is a river basin, which is all polygons. If you see on the left side, these are rivers based on lines. These are polylines. The code for this is uh, already available in our appendix slide. We can, be, we can discuss this later. And now I'll hand it to uh, Alex for the modeling part. Hi, thank you. Um, so uh, just to uh, review on what's going on. So uh, Maddie is talking about that there are some multiple factors of flood successibility. And also uh, Umesh talked about the idea of this risk perception based on some socioeconomic factors that involve. And then Ritesh has talked about visualization. Now I'm gonna talk about on how we actually uh, predict the flood using all of these uh, confounding factors that we found. So um, uh, there's some existing models, machine learning models out there. So, um, so what you see here, there's two uh, papers from the Journal of Hydrology that I've read. Um, so here I'm gonna, um, <clears throat> just to summarize on what they talk about and uh, maybe implementing this later. So uh, next please. So the idea that they have is that there's some um, two factors that they involve to compute risk of what is the probability of having uh, an area to be flood or not, right? So first factor was about the hazard uh, factors. Uh, so these hazard factors that they talk about is, um, you know, for example, rainfall, like how much rain does this area have given some time frame? Um, also elevation, uh, the distance to river, and then distance to channels, and then depth of groundwater, and also land use. So these factors, they integrated into the model in order to predict uh, risk. And then the other factors that they, uh, they considered is what they called uh, vulnerability. Uh, next, uh, please. So the vulnerability factors that they uh, implemented was, uh, for example, the quality of buildings, right? So they integrated that into the model, whether, uh, so they're trying to do like, they're trying to classify each building, whether it's like a very high quality versus the low quality. And also they consider the socioeconomic conditions of the population within an area. So for example, you have a really high socioeconomic conditions, really good, uh, sorry, really good economic conditions or really low economic condition, and also population density, and then the history of buildings on whether it's old or not, uh, old or new, and then they have also the last is the urban density, like how dense is an area, in order for them to compute this probability of a flood event. And so, uh, next please. Uh, so the risk is basically just the probability of a flood event happening. And so what they did is they used this uh, machine learning model. Uh, next, please. Yeah, thank you. So, so they used this decision tree algorithm with naive Bayes uh, model in order to predict whether an area is flooded or not. So given this, all of this input hazard and vulnerability, they put it into this uh, it's not entirely black box model because they made this tree, uh, decision tree, in order for them to uh, interpret the model on answering why is it flooded. And then the output that they used is just zero or one, just be flood and non flood. So basically, their model is just a really complicated binary classification problem. But not only that it's going to predict flood or not, it can also answer why, because there is uh, some this tree algorithm that they use, which is really helpful on communicating to uh, the population on why their area is going to be flood, flooded. Uh, next, please. And so um, the next step is that uh, modeling this flood risk is probably really complicated, but it it's really boils down to uh, like a really this simple binary classification problem. So what we did is like we, uh, we started some data collection and processing. And so I given you these two links. Um, I did it in uh, Python. Um, so we're trying to apply it into some specific area in Massachusetts. 
um, but we didn't really have time to uh, integrate this uh, model. But uh, we bring some summaries and some code that um, for for the next person to start this with. Um, and then uh, for the last thing is that uh, this literature review, uh, I, I listed all of the uh, factors there and how um, <clears throat> how should you access this model. And then um, Maddie is going to talk about the summary of everything. All right, so um, what we hope that we've done today is given um, a, a high level overview um, that will set up whoever comes along next um, with enough information to feel like they can pick up the ball and run with it um, with hopefully more time and more um, in-person opportunities to collaborate and continue to develop this. So to summarize the topics that we've covered, it's kind of this, this quadrant of, of necessities. Um, which included being able to conceptualize a global problem um, to be able to then think about a global solution. And of course, um, with flooding and natural disasters around the world, people may perceive risk differently. So it's important to consider those, those human factors um, and who is where, um, a, a common problem of geography. And then we have the more hands-on side of it um, that Ritesh um, and Alex then covered, which is the visualization and the modeling and the actual um, behind the scenes data crunching. Um, and as Alex mentioned, there are resources available um, and we'll make sure we get links to everybody. But um, with the visualizations, there are options um, where World One being the NASA product is um, the direction that we're going. Um, but every type of data has trade-offs. Um, I remember my geography teacher saying raster is faster, but vector is corrector. So you always have to um, make these little trade-offs. Um, and then also with the actual modeling and, and coming up with a, an, a solution that's interpretable and scalable so that um, we can help the most people possible. And it's a, it's a very big problem and you just got to kind of chip away at it a little bit at a time. So with that, let me click through. Um, we have a handful of references, and we would be more than happy to take any questions. <laughs>